Hello, boys and girls. It's Stuart with a new Let's Play, Sid Meier's Civilization Beyond Earth. Now, this game, it, it's gotten a lot of kind of criticism for various shortcomings, and I, I kind of disagree with that. I, I think it's actually a lot better than most of the critics claim it is, and, well, I'm going to be going over what they did really solidly well and like just an amazing job with I'm also going to point out some of the flaws it's a flawed game but it's not a broken game if that makes sense uh, and, and I'm definitely I'm looking forward to it I I'm a huge fan of Civilization ever since Sid Meier's Civilization 2 I've played like every single one to like hours uh, actually if I sat back and thought about probably more like months and months maybe even years of time invested into playing just various iterations of Civilization. Uh, I really, really like the series. Um, I do think, though, that the recent uh, releases, uh, Beyond Earth and as well as actually Civ Five, and a lot of people are going to say, well, you're insane, Civ Five is the best of the series, but it has, it just, there's a few things that are a little bit different and um, took some getting used to for me, so... Anywho, anywho, let's uh, let's set up a game. I, I have played a little bit. I haven't gone into end game at all yet, so uh, this is almost going to be. A, I'm, I'm gonna. I played about, mm, I'd say, 50 turns or so of it. So it's it's like I'm kind of going to be new at it. So we'll be learning as we go along ourselves. Um, all right, so. Here is one of the critics. I, I will cover a lot of my criticisms, right? I'm going to cover a lot of that, but I also don't. I don't want to make it a negative review because there's some stuff that's really, really good about Beyond Earth, and it's one of those games that I honestly feel like because the hype was so high on it that it people felt disappointed, even though if the title had been standalone, if if they hadn't like been really hyping it up before release, I think people have said, hey, it's it's actually a pretty satisfying and fun game. But yeah, we'll, we'll get to all that. We'll get to all that as we go along. So what difficulty are we going to do? Uh, let's see. Um, da -da. Probably Vostok or Gemini. Small. Okay, I'm going to assume this is like Deity, this is Impossible, and this is Monarch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try Gemini. I'm new to the game, so that might come back to bite me, you know, bite me in my butt. But uh, we'll see, we'll see. And then let's see game pace. I'm just gonna do default, standard with eight players. That's fine. Uh, usually I play eight to ten players. All right. So here is probably my first criticism of the game, and it's a really, it, it's actually a pretty strong criticism. I feel when I heard about Beyond Earth. I thought it was going to be a spiritual successor to Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, which is, it's one of my favorite games of all time. I, for what they did, like, it, I mean, it came out, what, like, 1995 or so, and it had full 3D, it, it had just player customization that you wouldn't see again in, like, any 4X game. All kinds of options to raise and lower. It was just, there were so many cool features and it was real well integrated. But what really drove Alpha Centauri, what really sold the game, was the amazing background story and, and the compelling characters. I, I mean, you could really feel for the the, the factions because they, they weren't just kind of this mishmash, like, you know, and they, they actually had a face attached to them. And I think... The storytelling in Beyond Earth, it's a real shame because it could have been as good of, as Alpha Centauri. It, it really, they were right on the cusp of it, but they missed one key thing. And I think that key thing is they forgot that in storytelling, people don't care about nations. We're, we're, you know, human beings didn't evolve to think in huge numbers of people clashing together. We evolved to think of, oh, one leader in particular having all the forward momentum. And see, in Alpha Centauri, all the factions had a face. They, you know, there's Lady Deidre Sky uh, running the Gaians. There's uh, Provost, uh, what was the name? Provost uh, Zarkov. 
um, this crazy kind of mad scientist guy running the science faction, the, the University of Planet. You know, they all had faces and they all had interesting, compelling background stories and very, like, it, it in a way, like, it, it really emphasized the philosophy all these different factions were going to follow and it really helped just instantaneously, like, right there, I was able to say, oh, I know what this faction is about. I know what their, like, what the goals are, like, what their feelings are. For, and, and it just, it really drove home the story. When you don't attach a face to something, when it's kind of this weird entity, people can't respond to it. And it's such a shame because, like, if instead of designating sponsors like this, and it's just, like, Pan-Asian Cooperative, what a boring, what a boring-sounding label. Oh, Pan-Asian. That, that's, like... How am I gonna get behind that? What does that mean to me as as a, a, a experiencer of the story? It, it, nothing. Poly Australia. Oh, I, I really feel for the Poly Australians. It, you know, it's just like the closest it came to it in this was Kavithan Protectorate. This one got me interested because I'm like, well, what's Kavithan? What are they talking about? And then I go into Civilpedia, I read about the background story and find out, oh, it's a fundamentalist group that sprouted up in on the Indian subcontinent that essentially united India back with Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, like, that is uh, it's kind of compelling. It has a face to it. There, there's one central leader, Kavitha, who is, is running the show, and I can get behind that. Why didn't they do that for any of the other factions? Why don't they have a face associated with it? ARC. I, I don't I don't know what the ARC is. What's a shame is if you go in the Civilpedia, you read the background, it's they actually have stories. There's actually like a whole feel behind them. But they really, really miscalculated. What they could have done is honestly, instead of having these factions uh, do what they do in the Civilization games. Attach it to a leader. Attach it to some kind of a figure that people can instantly understand and sympathize with. And they didn't do it, and it, it cost them so much on a compelling story, on drawing people into the world, on just really making them interested in what was going on. And it's so sad, because there is that story. It's in the Civilopedia. You can go and read about it. They just did a a poor job of presenting it and that's why it, it's like mistakes like that one or two maybe the game would have not gone as harsh uh, reviews as it, it did receive but when you make enough of those mistakes when you really kind of compound and compound like the, the failure to uh, capitulize on these opportunities it, it it hurts it really hurts the game's reputation and it just it makes people not care and it's a shame because they had the story they did all this background stuff but they hit it they, they didn't make it obvious to the player so it's a shame but um anyway let's let's figure out what faction are we going to play as and this kind of ties into what our goal is now there's really three possible uh, routes you can follow in the game. You can either go for purity. Pure, purity is essentially human beings are going to remain human beings. We're not going to become cyborgs and we're not going to hybridize with alien biology to become a new species. We're staying human and gosh darn it, we're going to do everything possible to make it so that we can succeed even though like we're not augmenting our brains, even though we're not you know, give it, giving up half our DNA to xeno DNA. You know, it's the faction that wants to wants to define themselves by their humanity. Supremacy is a faction that basically says, you know what? It's the end of the human era. It's the dawn of the artificial intelligence. It's the singularity. It's time for humanity humanity to progress and become something different, something new, uh, something that maybe is more machine than biology. Something that probably has. Uh, you, you know, it's basically, if you've ever read um, Forward to the Singularity or uh, by Ray Kurzweil or any of those sort of like tra transhuman or post-human philosophies, that's what supremacy is all about. It's all about the idea that eventually our artificial intelligence and our machinery will actually surpass humanity 
but maybe not subvert what we hold true to our values. Maybe actually make us more moral, maybe make us more ethical and understanding. So it's, it's, one, it's the idea you're essentially progressing beyond like the limitations of humanity. Now with harmony, the whole idea is, you know, the human race, we've come to a new, a new planet with a brand new ecosystem. And what we want to do is we want to adapt to it. We want to become part of this ecosystem to understand it, to interact with it, and ultimately to transform ourselves into something different because of our interaction with that ecosystem. Something, um, it's going to be biological in nature, but it's also going to be um, new and, and it's also changing humanity. So that, that breaks down the three factions. For me, I really like the story of the supremacy faction. They're all compelling. They're all interesting. And I think it might be, if, if we really get into this, I might do playthroughs for all three. But I, I like the singularity, the whole concept of moving beyond the limitations of biology into a brave new frontier of augmented intelligence, of vast uh, new energy sources like for me like progress through technology it's my jam it's my jam so we're going with that so which faction is good for that though well it's interesting because they don't really have none of the faction bonuses really like point you in any particular direction but they do influence your style of play uh, the ARC, and again, ARC, well, what does that mean to me? Nothing. Like, and there's, look, no story. I just click on it and select it. It doesn't even have a little pop-up telling me who the heck these guys are and, and what, they're, what they're about. Um, basically, they're a corporation that has taken over the United States. So, you know, they're, they're a lot, they're involved with computers. They, they're involved with biotechnology. They basically own... The majority of United States business. So that's what the a ARC is. But does does this bonus really reflect that? Okay, covert operations are 25% faster. That almost sounds like a hacker faction. That almost sounds like um, they'd be some kind of a spy-based faction, not a company. You would think with companies, it would be about credits and accumulating wealth, and this is not about that. <laughs> so, it, you know, that's, that's such a problem. It, it's, it's a real hit to making the game something you can get into. But we'll get into it anyway. We'll push through some of the, the mistakes that were made by just by like, the way they present the story. Uh, now, Pan Asian Cooperative. I, I understand what that is. It's basically China, may, maybe um, including some Japan in that. Like, like you know, hardworking people who are willing to do massive construction projects and the like. And so they get water production, worker speed boost. That, that's fairly good. Um, it, but honestly, the wonders are a little bit underwhelming. It's it's a shame. They they don't. A few of them can be quite good, you know, there's like the gene vault that gives you a huge boost to your food, but uh, it, it just, I don't know, it's, it's not the same as it was in like the Civilization games where you beeline towards one wonder and you desperately want to get to there first. Uh, this one is actually really good, Franco-Iberia, and again, like, do you, it, it, like, this is another issue I have, like, some of the countries that they're, they, I watched a developer interview, right? And what they basically were arguing is that, oh, we're trying to imagine what it would be like if the civilizations from Civilization V went out to space and colonized a new world, and what those civilizations would be like based on current trends. I'm sorry, but I don't see the European Union collapsing. I see it getting stronger and more integrated. And also, if it were to collapse, I don't see Franco-Iberia, like the, the two... And no offense to my French, like, and, and my Spanish viewers, it's like, um, I just, I don't see those two cultures really um, synthesizing into one country, at least before, um, like, honestly, I think, well, it's hard to say. I, 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 I know France's economy is going to pick up because they're very proactive about alternative fuels. They're, they're, they've always been a player in the world market. But there's still there's some tension with immigration. You worry about is is the French workforce going to 
really be significant going forward to the future. And the current trends indicate, no, it's, it's more actually going to be Eastern Europe that is growing in their economies than Western Europe. So I, I don't see why Franco-Iberia would be, quote unquote, the future of Europe. I, I, I think that the future of Europe, it's gonna be a lot more integrated, a lot more European Union focused, but a lot of the economic growth is actually going to be coming from immigration from the Middle East, as well as the growth in population of Eastern Europe, as well as, well, not to mention, like, because Eastern Europe's infrastructure is so bad, in a way it's good for economic growth, because there's a lot of room for investing. So, I, I just, I don't know, like, if, I, if you ask me to come up with factions based on current trends, I would almost argue for more of a Pol Polish or Hungarian style European faction. And, and I'm not trying to insult any anyone in Europe. I actually, I think culture-wise, like France is one of the most influential countries on the planet, as well as Spain. Um, you look at like the extent of French and Spanish language. You look at all the amazing scientific progress produced by the French. And, and, and it's just like, in the future, I don't know if they are going to be as much of a power player as this implies. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting. Like, who knows? Maybe France will get over their kind of... Um, right now, there's a fairly strong anti-immigrant push in France. And if that goes away, if they open their borders as Germany has, as Poland has, I think France has a really bright future. But if they start to descend into this kind of anti-immigrant um, concert like far right wing parties getting more and more support and if that takes off it's it's going to be a real challenge for france going forward into the future we'll see what happens I, again you know predicting the future who knows but uh, i just I, i'm left wondering why it is that they would predict something like um france and spain being the the leaders of europe anyway so Sorry if that offended people. I'm not trying to offend. I'm just making a, a, a judgment based on current trends, I guess. So um, the Slavic Federation, let's see. So orbital units are actually quite good. Um, and petroleum is still sadly very important in the future. That is a decision I kind of disagree with. I, I don't think petroleum would be something a spacefaring civilization has to even deal with. It, they'd be dealing more in fusion. I can't imagine us doing interplanetary or interstellar flights before nuclear fusion is developed and perfected. I just, it's not, I can't wrap my mind around that. So I don't think like this, even having petroleum in the game doesn't make much sense, but whatever, you know, they, they have it. It's a good resource. You use it a lot. Very solid faction, the Slavic Federation. And it's basically, this is basically the USSR 2.0. Um, I do think Russia, their economy, is going to continue to grow. Uh, I also think that a lot of that has to do with not just energy futures, but they're, they're going through an ec not an economic rebound, but also population rebound. It's all about demographics. When you, when you project what the world is going to be like in 2050, you think about who has more labor pool available. And I think that you know the Russian people are actually starting to they, they went through a hard period, like in the 90s, where there was a severe demogra demographic downturn, people weren't having children, but that seems to be rebounding. And considering all the, the resources Russia has still available to it, I can't see it not growing well into 2100. It's going to be a major player in the world. Uh, it already is, but I mean, it's going to be like the third superpower. We may, there's going to be like four superpowers, honestly, going forward. Um, the United States is going to remain a strong economy. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we have access to shipping in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. I mean, no other large country on Earth with, has the infrastructure to ship goods between those two oceans. And because that's essentially the world economy turns around ocean trade, the United States is almost always going to guarantee a very strong economy. Um, just just for that reason, uh, thanks to the accident of geography. I also think that there's a good chance uh, for Russia to rebound as well, especially once the Northwest, the Northwest, <laughs> the Northwest Passage opens back up in 
Uh, essentially, as the ice sheets in Ar the Arctic Ocean recede, we're going to see a lot more trade happening in, in that region, and it's going to actually kind of shift to become a very important sea route. So Russia will finally have their warm water po ports that they've been desperate for for centuries, and because of that, it's going to just really, really lead to a huge increase in their economy. Uh, another one I see going forward being a enormous players India and obviously like it, it India is modernizing almost faster than China is it it's very interesting to see and, and what I like about it too is India is investing very heavily in preserving their environment and guaranteeing a food supply for their people without compromising rainforest if they can maintain it so it, it's interesting they're kind of becoming um, the renewable energy kings and it, or I, su I suppose Rajas and, <laughs> or, and it, it's, it's going to I think India going forward is going to be a, a major player in the world economy and, and just in general Indian culture it's, it's very influential actually uh, you look at Bollywood you look at um, all the literature that's come out of India you look at the fact that Indians are not only are they, as a people, very adaptable and very, um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, well basically, they're, they're very multicultural, very cosmopolitan, you know, and part of that is from adapting to the long British rule, the Raj. Um, I'm, you know, there's pluses and minuses about colonialism, but I feel like the British... Um, they did set India up to participate more in the world economy than a lot of their other colonies were. The, the other thing like about India too is they're, they believe in education, they're trying to get it available to their citizenry, and as a result, like over time, we're going to see a major shift in wealth for the Indian people. And then finally, there's China, and, and China's going to, be, it's going to be the wealthiest nation on the planet fairly soon. It's um, the forefront of innovation and science. It's a very interesting model, actually, because they've adapted Confucian meritocracy to the open market. So it's an experiment. Um, I think it has a lot of potential to eventually inspire other countries to ad adopt such a creed, the idea of having an elite ruling smartly over an open economy. We'll see if it's sustainable, though. I, I, I wonder about going forward, will the Chinese people be willing to accept a limited freedoms in exchange for um, increases in wealth and prosperity and, and relative happiness? I, I believe they will. Um, it, it, China has a history of such a system. And you know, if you look at uh, China during its dynastic periods, when the country was prospering, when the people felt comfortable in their skin, they didn't mind the idea that, oh, sometimes the military is going to need resources that we would like to have but need to give up. And I think that, you know, within China, it's going to work quite well. I do wonder if the Chinese system will be adaptable to other countries. Well, we'll wait and see. I mean, I can definitely see a country like North Korea eventually opening up its economy to free trade, trying to go like the Chinese route. I can also see that in Southeast Asia. I don't know if it's, and, and possibly in Africa as well, but I don't know if it's going to be as influential an idea as Western liberalism. I, I don't know if it's going to really shape and change the entire world as opposed to outside of Asia. And I don't think China, like, honestly, I don't think they're that interested in being a an in i guess a, a a country with a lot of soft power they want some soft power to guarantee that their materials flowing in from other countries and that they have influence on the world stage because you have to have that in this day and age with how globalization is going but i don't know if the chinese mindset it has moved beyond the idea of being the middle kingdom, of being very strong and prosperous, but within their own sphere of influence. So who knows? Well, let's see. the future is going to be interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Like some countries are definitely going to rise, like Canada uh, and 
if, if Greenland doesn't declare independence, Denmark, <laughs> you know, it's all these Arctic nations are essentially going to become far more influential on the world stage and far more uh, wealthy. Uh, and that includes, you know, includes the U.S., it includes Russia, Canada, Denmark, the, the Nordic countries, um, especially as the uh, Northwest Passage opens up, especially as trade becomes possible across the Arctic Circle. I think that's going to be a major demo demographic shift. Anyway, that's my, that's my piece. <laughs> um, let, let's continue. I've been like, gosh, it's like podcast here right now. Let's see, Polystralia. Trade routes are actually quite powerful. Um, it's it's a little bit difficult though, since it's this is limited to your capital. So if you don't start on an ocean, you're not going to have a great time. It, you know, the sea routes are worth far more, and this basically is saying I'm going to be reliant on ocean trade. So that's the whole, and it makes sense. You think Polynesia? Um, there were ocean-faring people, so sure. Um, Kavithan Protectorate. This one's interesting. It, it basically encourages growth, but not within cities, within like a territorial sense. So this is an early kind of land grab civilization. Uh, you're, it, the whole idea is you want to like push out, spread, spread out early on because you get this boost to all. Because eventually the map does fill up and it's not like you're going to be building any new outposts and cities. But early game, this will give you a distinct advantage. Uh, this one's interesting. Like, I don't see why they... I, it's odd to me, actually, that they see Brazil as being the militaristic faction. I understand that, yeah, um, Brazil has been classically a, a pretty expansionist power. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't really... It, it's a bit odd to me that they focus on Brazil as being, like, the military faction. I would have thought that the military faction uh, would have been, um, you, you know, well, it's hard to say, actually. <laughs> it really is kind of hard to say. Like, I would almost think, though, uh, Central America more than South America. And, I'm, you know, it, it comes down to the fact that you can imagine if going forward to the future, say the state of Mexico is unable to recover from their current civil war. And they, I mean, when you lose 20,000 people in a year, it's a civil war. It, it, it's a, 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 like almost a narco civil war going on in Mexico. And it's, it's odd to me that people don't seem to care about that, that they, that we even have like horrible policies in the U S of sending guns to to the the narcotics dealers like it, it's mind-boggling that uh we're, we're allowing this instability to happen right on our borders with a valuable trade partner and i can definitely see like mexico going forward be, becoming a more police state becoming um reliant on violence to uh basically secure secure their country and it, it breaks my heart i mean it's um I, it, I don't know it's it's tough knowing that essentially like if you look at the history of the United States a lot of our prosperity came from stealing it from Mexico um, essentially con the conquest of California and all the southwest states robbed Mexico of its future and and I'm not saying like you know it's, it's tough because from my point of view as an American I benefit from that I benefit greatly from the fact that you know the United States economy is as strong as it is. Um, at the same time, though, it's it's tough because I, you know, I have friends of Mexican ancestry, and you can kind of see the pain of it. You know, it's it, they see their country falling into chaos. They see their families torn to pieces by all all this internal struggle and violence, and a lot of that, it, you know, it is front directly based on United States policies towards Mexico. So, I don't know, like, I, I wonder, like, would it have been better maybe if, as an entity, Mexico and the United States had fused together, or if they had remained even more separate and Mexico maintained its land? I don't know what would have been a, a, a route that would have been best for both countries, but, um, I don't know, it, it, it just strikes me as odd, though, that they're seeing Brazil as being the, the, conque the conquerors, the violent folk, um, 
But then again, uh, to be fair, historically, Brazil, it, it was under a military junta until recently. Um, it It's a very, if you look into the not too distant past, I mean, there's been many wars between Brazil and other countries surrounding it. So maybe that was the right call. Maybe that was a... Uh, um, the way to go. Who knows? Uh, African Union. Uh, this this one is the one that makes most sense to me um, for two reasons. Africa is quickly becoming the breadbasket of the world, uh, especially as it modernizes. Especially as uh, you know, we, we get past the, the military dictatorships and more and more democracies and free trade opens up in Africa. Uh, there's so much arable land that hasn't been exploited there on top of and don't get me wrong like i i hope that they don't exploit all of it i would hate to see like the congo rainforest disappear but you know at the same time a lot of the food on earth even today is actually grown and exported from africa and people don't really realize that like it's a major exporter of fish it's a major exporter of anything you can grow on a plantation uh, coffee chocolate like like any kind of cash crop honestly Africa is where people go to when when they want to see that you know well get the secure those supplies Benello is another one if you include Madagascar so I think this makes a lot of sense that they would give the African Union a food boost um, it also makes sense that there's this little penalty like health is very important and if you don't maintain high health um then you end up with you know kind of uh almost like uh lag and i don't know if i'm pronouncing this right lagos is is to the or la lagos i don't know um it's the largest city in africa it's it's in nigeria and like that's the thing it's grown it very quickly but it's still it's a slum city. There's a lot of violence between the police and its citizens. There's a breakdown in local government, you, you know. Um, so this makes sense. You know, if you can keep your city, your law and order high, if you can keep your health well, you'll continue to grow. But you'll also have, you have the chance of slipping back into the slum city and seeing that the food kind of go away. So it's an, it's it, this is probably the most accurate like breakdown I think of all of, out of all of these guys. But, uh, so who are we going to pick? Well, I don't know. It's interesting. Like, there, there are three factions I really like. And there's a fourth that I think is strong. But I, I just, like, for whatever reason, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really do it for me, I guess. Because uh, it's more a peace, peace-loving faction. I'm about science and conquest. <laughs> like, honestly, that's my, um, that's my jam in the Civilization games. Um, ARC I do like because covert operations can, they can be real game changers. There, there's a lot of kind of cool things that can happen with it. So that's tempting. I, I do like covert operations and it, it's, I mean, look at this emblem. It's, it's quite cool. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like big brother is watching you. I, I honestly, you can almost pick things off of the emblems. Um, another one I really like is I, I like Orbital Unions a lot, so the Slop Federation um, is a really tempting choice. Um, Franco Iberia is actually a very strong faction. It just, hmm, I, I don't know. There's something about, like, it, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't really inspire me, I guess. Uh, you know, it, I'm not, not trying to insult anybody or anything, but it's just, I, I don't get excited thinking about France and Spain combined. I, I would be a lot more for this if it was uh, the European Union. You know, if it was just like everybody, not just like, I, I don't know, it's, it's strange. But um, the, the uh, free virtue, that's huge in the long run. Like, virtues are quite powerful. They can change the course of your civilization. And getting a free one, you, this this will really vault you ahead of people over time. The problem is you have to really focus on culture, and and honestly, the the, the whole culture scene can be, um, it has its perks, but when you're devoting so much to culture and losing out on say growth and and science, it can be a, a little bit of an issue. This one's interesting um, for the worker speed. 
but unfortunately this worker speed buff doesn't really line up with unless he unlocks some of the wonders it doesn't line up all that well so i'm i'm thinking i'm gonna go with the slavic federation i i love orbital units in this game they're quite powerful and you know the other stuff doesn't quite hurt either so we're going to be, be dominating the air the orbital plane so to speak uh, the stars will be ours and you know no one's going to stop us from uh, achieving total domination of, of space so that, that's our goal we'll, we'll stick with the Slavic Federation plus I mean in Soviet Russia <laughs> I don't know um, let's see so since we are going that route science would be good so would engineers hmm it's a tough decision I feel like science is ultimately it will boost everything else so it's probably the way to go um, production can be quite handy though uh, it, you know there, there's a lot of buildings that can take quite some time to build especially early game and getting those earlier can set you up for victory even faster but you know honestly I'm gonna go with the science um, food is always good as well although this game um, they can you can really be penalized for growing too quickly if your health goes down so this can be a tricky one you kind of have to balance things out a bit if you're going the, the pure growth route and what I'm thinking though is we're gonna stick with science because why not we'll be like so like not so like Russian rocket experts or something now this is interesting there's uh, um, see they give you a, a random like spacecraft um, let's see and the, these bonuses aren't all that great actually like so you get the hundred energy um, you'll quickly outpace the extra hundred energy you, you might be able to use this for buying some key buildings early on but you make a lot of energy going forward so that's something to keep in mind like it this advantage won't turn out to be the, the biggest advantage this one is surprisingly good it can take a while to unlock petroleum uh, and knowing where it is like planning for it especially when we already have that petroleum boost is a really good advantage this one I would recommend if you're doing like a multiplayer game it's not all that necessary in single player um, I kind of I'm surprised it didn't make it so that like you, you got a little bit more of a boost for different things like this one like it'd be nice if they paired this off with like revealing resources and had that both these be one option and like this and this one could be together and then they could add like some other boot I don't know there, there's more they could have done with this but it's it's kind of a small part of the game anyway I think we're gonna go with um, gosh it's it's hard to say honestly like None of the advantages are all that key, but I do like being able to plan stuff. And this will put us more in line with the um, AI, because I believe the AI just automatically knows where every resource is. So that will kind of like even the odds. So I'm going to go with this. It will help us plan a bit better. So, And this one. Let's see. Pioneering is a really good technology to start with. Um, hmm. And so is starting with a, a worker or a soldier or a clinic. Gosh. <laughs> um, well, we're going for the science faction. We're going for kind of like dominance of space. Let, let's just get a free technology out of it. That's in line with our plans. And we're going for supremacy. So here is one of the big strengths of this series. They, they did such a fabulous job with coming up with interesting worlds uh, I mean look we can go to the advanced worlds and they're all based on potential exoplanets we've discovered there's it's just very like I, I love the options that they give you in this like you know as you go along just looking at them we've got equatorial with bulging equator and day night cycle much shorter than Earth's uh, interesting you know I, I like that they're, they're thinking about this kind of stuff um we've also got let's see you know tectonic plates and without oceans or easily accessible water it's just like they, they, oh it's cool i think they did a really good job with it um 
I'm not sure, like, it's funny, like, I, I praise the world. Uh, what I don't like, though, and, and we'll see in a minute, is, well, well, I'll talk about it when it comes up, but basically, like, the, the, the texture, the, the choice of textures was poor in this game. Uh, and I'll break down why in a sec. Let, let's pick a world, though. Um, this one's cool, too. You know, it's blistering desert and then frozen. I kind of like this idea. Um, I don't know, though. Maybe, I think for our first playthrough, though, we should focus on kind of like a Terran world. You know? Yeah, we'll go, we'll go with just kind of a Terran world. And let's hit start. So, art, let's talk about the art of the game. So the art direction, whoever did these kind of backgrounds, and, and yeah, I get that this is actually a NASA image that they kind of touched up in Photoshop, but they still, it, it really draws you in. It looks good. I mean, it's it's beautiful. Like, I believe this is actually the Horsehead Nebula. I'm not quite sure, but it, it yeah, ooh. I, I love some of, some of the kind of title cards and, and just the, the stuff they put in between scenes. So let's let's hit start here. I'm the advanced integration and um, or advisor. I'm, I'm tempted to leave this guy on. There's still some stuff I haven't found out about the game. I'm worried it's gonna be obnoxious. Um, let, let's say I'm an experienced player. We can always turn him off later. See, no, we'll just. And we don't want full guidance. We'll do advice only. If it gets too annoying, we can turn them off. But, I mean, there's some stuff that pops up and I really like. Okay, so... Whoever did these textures, why? Why would you do this? It's, it's gray. It's flat. Like, when I play a 4X game, one of the selling points, one of the things that's going to draw me in and make me interested is if the game looks good. This doesn't look that good. It's it's purple and and just you know I'm not. It doesn't draw me in. Now I understand I'm probably running it on some of the lower graphic settings, so maybe it looks better on higher graphic settings. But it should look good no matter what your graphic setting is. It should be something that you can really draw draws the eye and get you excited about. I mean, compare this to Warlock Two. Where, I mean, you look at like, say, the living lands. Well, just pick in the middle here. And the living lands are just these like bright, gorgeous green, vibrant colors with cool little details like buildings sprouting up here and there from elven towers. And, and the trees move a little bit because, you know, it's a, such a lush ecosystem that the trees can move around. It, like Something like that really draws me in and, and gets me excited. This, I mean, some of it looks good. I, I think we go over here and like I think the little kind of fungusy looking forest and stuff looks nice. I just, but this purple gooey, like it just, why couldn't it be better colors? Like, and, and that's what's so sad. It's like, some things they're really spot on with, some things it just fell so flat on, and this is one of them. It just, it doesn't draw me in and get me excited for it. So, yeah, that was a real miss, I think, a real miss. And it's a shame because so much of the art is so solid in this. The, the, the cards for loading screens. Look how, like, crisp yet soft, like, these, the, whoever did the interface for this, by the way, is brilliant. Like. It looks so good, and it's just, mm, like, if only the the art of the actual terrain could match up with the the rest of the art, and, and it's a shame. And I, I saw an interview about it where, you know, they, they wanted to basically make it different. They wanted it to be something that wouldn't remind people of Civ Five, which confuses me because basically the two people who want to play this game either are coming in because they played Alpha Centauri and they're hoping it's going to be like Alpha Centauri was, or people who played Civ V and want to, want to continue the story with kind of this, this exciting new uh, land. And, and so, would it have been so bad to make it less kind of dull gray and purple? I, you know, I don't think it would have. 
it, it's I don't know. <laughs> some some lands do look nice. Like I do actually like some of the desert and the snowy biomes, but I mean this purple grassland stuff just doesn't draw me in. It it looks flat and and honestly it looks like some like a um it's a it's I hate to say it, but like if I ate too many blueberries or something, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just uh, what a shame. But let's uh, let's do some exploring, huh? Let's actually move ahead. How much movement do I want? Let's let's end on the up on a hill so we can look around. Now you want to watch out, and, and this is another thing. Like see this miasma? It's honestly hard to see the miasma, which. For something that is such like a critical game concept, that should be really, really obvious. It should be something that, when you notice, you you can avoid. And yet, I can. It it's so subtle, it's so subtle. I just I can't. I can barely see it. I I find myself oftentimes having to just read. You know, like look for. Oh, okay. Um, miasma. No miasma. Like, ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know, guys. <laughs> they could have done something with. It. Well, it's our first turn, so we have all kinds of things going on. Here are the victory conditions. We'll, we'll be going for uh, emancipation. Um, basically, our goal is to become the Borg and go and reconquer Earth. <laughs> so we're going to want to work towards a laser comm satellite, which... It, it, well, here's, here's another problem. Let's pull up the science. What... Why? Well, why this confusing branching system? I don't even know where the... How do I launch a satellite? I don't know. No one does. Like, it's it's launch complex, I guess? Um, yeah. It, it, look, look how confusing this is. It's just a massive stuff getting thrown at you all at once. And if you haven't played the game, this is very... It's intimidating. It, it just... You know, you look at this and you wonder, like, what the heck are we going to go for? And none of this makes sense. And I, again, like, I watched, like, the, the developer talks and they were talking about why they chose this. And the goal was they wanted, essentially, what they wanted was for as you play, new situations might arise and you have to think quickly on the fly. And they didn't want to limit you to branch, like going deep into a branch. They want to encourage a wider research path as opposed to a tighter, taller one, which I think is a cool idea. I think they just could have presented it a little better. They could have broken things down a little bit and they have filters, you can filter stuff. Like, like if I want science, say, I can do this. And it's okay, it helps, but it doesn't, it just it, it it's still kind of it's a it's a hot mess. It, it's a big pile of hot mess, and I really wish that they had vetted this. That someone had been able to come and say, no, this is it's too hard for people to tell what to go for and what they want. So we need to reconsider the whole concept because you know it's supposed to be leaves and branches. I don't I don't get the feeling that this is leaves and branches. I get the feeling that this is like a confusing web that people are going to have to figure out at some point and just it's a shame it's it's a real shame because there's a lot of potential with this and they just they didn't vet it they didn't have someone go through and say hey this this needs some some kind of uh, attention because i mean the icons look really beautiful like whoever did this interface um, the design of the interface is bad, but the art is solid. So it's sad. It, it saddens me that it's such a missed opportunity. But so what are we going to go for? What, what are we going to actually research? And I think we want to go for ecology. Two reasons for that. The vivarium is basically a granary. Um, you know, it gets you food. And then it can actually turn deserts into like, um, you know, useful terrain as well. So that's nice. It lets you clear miasma, which is very key. Uh, miasma is, it, it kills your units over time, so you want to clear it out. It also gives you an ultrasonic fence, uh, which helps with alien life forms because it keeps them from charging into your city and destroying it. And trust me, you are going to, you're going to tangle with the aliens. They're going to be quite dangerous, actually. 
So I think we'll go for ecology and then after that computing because I would like to unlock a spy agency. Um, I'd also like to work on stuff like um, getting some the network up and running. Although, uh, actually let's check something here. So filter supremacy. So this will show us what text to go for for if we want a supremacy, which we do. We want the supremacy victory. Yeah, you fit you Phoenix, I guess uh, the human hive that sounds great um, and alien materials and all that so see like, what they should have done and what they they mentioned was the original plan and it just got dropped was have the three branches like moving off of this so like have one branch for supremacy have one branch for harmony and one for purity and then maybe have text connecting them in between just organize it a little bit better I mean for for Christ's sake, this is like a mess, and uh, it's a shame. And that's 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 what happens in the game. It, there's so much of this like nearly good, nearly what people would have really gone after, and they just uh, they they miss it just a bit. Another tech we could consider is launch complex, because that gives you orbital coverage, which means that your cities, I mean your um uh satellites are actually going to be more efficient. You can put them in better locations. I also like that you get observatories, which is, um, it's nice. You can get phyraxite going, um, as well as, uh, basically rangers are archers. The thing is, uh, you really do need protection from the aliens. We're gonna beeline for ecology for now. And then maybe work on getting into physics and robotics and all that. Like I would love to get working on like drones and all this crazy like <laughs> cybernetic type stuff. But again, it's it's hard to tell because I mean you think oh robotics surely all the AI stuff is gonna be over here, but it's it's not. It's it's like down here, and it, you have to kind of hunt around and figure out what text you want, and yeah, it's just it's a shame. Anyway, well, we'll start with ecology first, though, because that one, um, clearing mass was very important, but so is ultrasonic fence. So, uh, production, what are we going to make? We don't have a worker. Now, starting with a worker is quite a good thing, um, but at the same time, I would actually encourage you to consider, consider not going for that option. So, and the reason why is early on, there are, there are a few improvements you can build, but cities grow a little bit slower um, than you expect them to. They, they also, your improvements, it takes research to really unlock them all. So, plus you don't get the penalty to growth that you get for, say, building a colonist. So, it, I, I think like it's okay not starting with a worker. In the multiplayer scenario, though, I would start with the worker because... You're, you're going to want um, to... Early improvements can definitely be helpful and and all that jazz, I guess. So, let's... Uh, also, our start is not all that solid. I'm not seeing any of those special resources. And our food seems to be limited. This is more of a... There's some areas for farmland, which is good to see because we're going to need it. But... It's it's more. This is gonna be a production city more than a science, more than a gold city, and that's it's tough when your capital's like that. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> and we're through the first turn. Whew, that took a little bit of time. This is kind of a cool idea. Um, over time, more and more factions will land um, around you, so you don't encounter everybody right away, and you actually get a little bit of a head start in some ways. Not much of one, but a little bit of one. Let's see, yeah, and this is uh, the the theocracy basically of India, Kavitha Kur of Kavithan Protectorate. So, yeah, she uh, she's supposed to be a little bit kind of like how you know Gandhi for the Hindus became the Mahatma, the Great Soul. She's basically united India in the face of ecological disasters and and made them. Um, you know, a unified people, but a stronger people for it. A people uh, dedicated to the cause of um, not just preserving the lives of humans, but also the environment and and all that. So this one actually has a, a story behind it, you know, like a face that I can attach to it. 
I really wish it had done that with all the other factions, but what are you going to do? Um, I, she won't want to do anything at first. Like, we can tell her not to sell. That's a nice one, actually. Um, I think it does hurt your relationship, though. I'm going to see if she'll go for it, but she won't. Yeah. Um, they need to be more comfortable. It's good to kind of, like, make nice with factions until you, you get stronger. And she's far enough away that I feel like she won't crowd us too much. You don't need that many cities in the game, but you will need a, a few, obviously. I believe it's a bit like Civ V, where you kind of want to aim for having, like, four cities, four strong cities, and then maybe some, some good trade routes with uh, bases and all that. So... Right now, we're just going to dedicate ourselves... Basically, the way I explore in 4X games is I tend to pick a corner and then go in like a circle around. So let's um, let's head up this way a bit. Let's see. No ma Oh, there's Miasma. Okay, so he's going to take a little bit of damage for stepping onto the Miasma. But it should be okay. You don't want to do that too often because it will start to add up and actually be... a a whole issue so and yeah sorry I don't have like I bet this would look better on higher graphics it's just <laughs> you, you know in, in a way like this is demonstrating the importance of having graphics look good no matter what machine people are playing on so uh, yeah just getting, getting a little drink or two here um, it's been it's been quite dry lately quite dry so now, what was uh, a really strong point? Ooh, let's let's go down there and scoop that up. <laughs> Ow, and he stepped on the asthma. Oops. Yeah, well, it, ooh, he's gonna take a lot of damage. That's not good. That's not good. Aliens. There are alien nests. It's really cool. This is one of the features that they did a, an excellent job on. The alien AI is. It's interesting. There's a lot of subtlety about it. There, there's a lot of cool kind of emergent behaviors with it. For instance, if the aliens, if you're nice to them, they're less likely to attack you. But if you send a lot of units near their nest, if you kind of pressure them, they will defend their nest. They'll, they'll come out in large numbers to kind of push you away from it. At the same time, if they get close to your cities... You can shoot them, and they'll remember that they got shot in the area and flee for quite a few turns. Then, you know, after they're done fleeing and being scared, they'll come back and, like, pressure a little bit more because, you know, it's like, now I have a dangerous, hostile entity in my territory. Like, like it's very subtle and very cool and, and interesting how they set that up. So, I really And again, this game, there's some very solid things. And there's some things that just fall flat so it's it's a shame Krubrost has grown excellent excellent um let's see uh I'm gonna actually I have to step in miasma it looks like to get to this it's um oh it's an alien nest hmm do we want to pressure that let's not I'm actually going to move away from that I, th I thought it was a life pod for some reason you don't really want to go after alien nest early. It it makes them super mad and it can be dangerous. Until I have ecology and I built the ultrasonic fence, I'm gonna be play nice for the aliens. Two citizens. So, yeah, you know, having the worker might have been a better choice, uh, just because it looks like we don't get much of. We do like it's nice to know there's a geothermal vent there. Um, in retrospect, I think, though, it would have been nicer to have the worker. I, I didn't think we'd have so many improvements we could build straight out the way. But, oh well. You know, you live and learn. And, and maybe when you guys play, you, you can avoid that mistake. So, uh, let's see. It's grown. Resource pod. Good stuff. Resource pods, they're basically, you know, they're, they're like finding a village or a village. And uh, we got 60 energy, and that's why, like, having the bonus energy at the beginning, I don't know, you get so much from resource pods that it, it doesn't really seem to hurt you. Like, there, maybe if you think that you'd have a building you want to rush by early on, maybe that'd be a good strategy. I don't know, though. 
Let's see. Oh, okay, Basalt. That's good. And this is Xenomass is nice. Xenomass, you can get... See, that's the thing. Like, why have Petroleum when you could just go with, like, weird alien version of it? I don't know. A quest. Okay, our first quest. So, this one's fairly straightforward. Quests are very... Uh, they did a great job with the quest. This is another really solid feature of the game. And essentially, quests will crop up from time to time. Depending on how you answer them, depending on how you follow them, it can completely change your civilization. So it, it's a very cool idea. It, it keeps you on your toes. It forces you to be adaptable. And I, I love it. I think they did an awesome job with the quest. And, you know, it is a shame that they have these solid, solid features that you can get really excited about and, and want to do and then fall flat in other ways. So, you know, um, very nearly an awesome game. Still a good game, in my opinion. But let's continue, let's continue. I, I wanna get a couple of turns in. It's gonna be a longer episode because I spent so much time talking about stuff. Let's see, Force with Miasma. Let's, let's move away from the Miasma. I don't want him to get too uh, beat up by that. Yeah, you have to actually really watch it. It doesn't seem like that much of a penalty, but it stacks up over time. Now, if this alien nest, like, seems potentially takeable, I'm, I'm going to try for it, but we'll see. Um, it can be dangerous, but I think we'll have the Ultra Sock fence fairly soon, and, and then we won't have to worry about the aliens so much. Let's see. Another quest update. Pioneering. Cool, we got that. Uh, found an outpost. We need to build a colonist unit. We we can start on that. Um, yeah, well, let's queue that up. Now queuing up stuff. You have to. It's kind of weird. You have to activate the production queue and then add a queue. I don't know why that that they make you do that step. It seems funny, but whatever. And they're they're gonna do it now. What to go for? Actually, hmm. I think a clinic might be better than a colonist at first because it's science and health. It's it's such a perfect combination of stuff. So we'll queue that up for after our worker gets in. Um, hmm. Trade Depot is different than you would think. It's a production boost. It's not a gold boost. Old Earth Relic is actually quite good. Culture can be very important in this game. It's, it's not something that you should take lightly whatsoever. So we'll definitely want to get some more culture going. Uh, because culture, it, it not only expands city borders, but you can use it for unlocking the virtues, which is really handy. Like the virtues can be very powerful uh, overall boost to your civilization. So they're worth pursuing. It's worth developing some culture. And you really don't want to neglect it outright. So let's see, we'll, we'll definitely do this quest. It'll just take some time uh, next turn. And let's see. Um, well, we don't really want to end on miasma, but I think we can get. Yeah, oh, some miasma there. Dang it. See, it's hard to see. You know, I, I wish it had been like more obvious. Like something that I could say, oh, shoot, it's everywhere, you know. And, and actually, you kind of see it as it floats around if you take a minute. But it's not something you can see just instantaneously. So. Little, little bit frustrated by that, but what are you gonna do? You know, yeah. See, the bugs are—they're stepping in to defend their nest. They—they they don't like the fact that we're pressing them there. So we'll have to do a quick skirt by and continue down. I can't. Oh, I'm out of moves. Okay, and hopefully they won't attack. We might lose our explorer here. Oh dear. Um. Yeah, and he he will kill us. I guess we're just gonna have to kind of be gentle and and navigate around them a bit. Maybe he'll scoot in, and then I can get around. They don't like it when you check out their nest. They get very protective, which makes sense. I mean, it's probably where all their young are, and they're animals. You know, they they see us as part of the environment, but we're a new predator in the area, and they might respond with force. Okay, and, and we're growing, you know, and you do grow pretty quickly in the game. So that's something to keep in mind. 
and these early turns aren't, you know, it's basically just us exploring a bit, looking around, encountering other cities as they come in, into play, so. Freeland. <laughs> Utama. Of, I don't even know if that's how you pronounce that. Of Australia. Okay. Do you think they put this faction in just because Australians complain and moan so much about how there's no Australian civilization series? I think they did. <laughs> I think literally this is just um, Phyraxis' response to all the complaints over the years that there's no Australian civilization. So there you go.